Hey guys, I'm John and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. Have you ever wondered what light actually is? Well, stick with me because by the end of this video, you'll know exactly what it is and how it behaves. Let's get started. Usually when we talk about light, we're talking about the visible light. But for this video, we'll be breaking it down into the fundamentals of what makes up light and how it behaves. So let's start by talking about what light is made of. In the beginning of the 20th century, we learned that light is made up of individual photons. Photons are little packets of energy that have no mass and transfer energy between atoms throughout the universe. They can't be split, they can only be emitted or absorbed. Photons also behave both as waves and as particles at the same time. We call this the wave-particle duality. Today we'll concentrate on the behavior of photons as waves. The wave itself is made up of an electric field and a magnetic field that are perpendicular to each other. It's the mix of these two fields that allows the photon to travel in a vacuum, while other waves like sound waves require the compression of air molecules in order to travel. In order to talk about photons as particles, we have to learn some quantum mechanics, so we would need to dedicate a whole separate video for that. For this video, don't think of a photon as a particle, think of it as a traveling wave. These waves carry electromagnetic radiation with very specific amounts of energy. This illustration shows only a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We can also see what the different frequencies correspond to. Very long wavelengths will have a very low amount of energy and very small wavelengths will have a very high amount of energy. In other words, the faster the oscillation, the more energy it has. In this example, AM radio has the longest wavelength and the lowest frequency and energy. As the frequency increases, the waves increase in energy and the wavelengths become shorter. As they become shorter, you get TV, FM radio, microwaves, infrared, and then our visual spectrum. Our visual spectrum is only a tiny sliver of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, and it's responsible for absolutely everything we see with our eyes. As the energy of the photons in increase, it goes from red to orange to yellow, green, blue, and violet. At higher frequencies than our visual spectrum, it becomes ultraviolet light, also known as UV light. It's at this point that the radiation starts to become energized enough to knock electrons out of their orbits. This is called ionizing radiation, and it's where it starts to become harmful to us. You'll probably recognize this warning symbol for ionizing radiation. Past the UV light, we have X-rays, which we use for medical purposes and security. And finally, we have gamma rays, which are the most dangerous form of ionizing radiation. Several feet of concrete or several inches of lead are required to block it. Regardless of which type of radiation you're looking at, all photons are the same. They just carry different levels of energy. So now that we know about the different wavelengths, let's talk about how light is actually born so we can better understand its behavior. Light is born through a process called the emission of light. To understand that, we have to understand how atoms behave and how they transfer energy. Each atom has electrons and each electron has orbitals that it can jump to. When an atom absorbs energy, the electron will jump to a higher orbit. Only an exact amount of energy can make the electron jump. If the energy of a photon is off by even a slight amount, it won't interact with the atom at all. After an atom has been excited, the electron can then jump back to a lower orbital. This will emit a photon containing the exact amount of energy that the atom just lost. This photon will also have a very specific frequency and wavelength corresponding to the energy that created it. As you can see here on the right, you have an example of the wavelengths that can be emitted by atoms depending on how many orbitals are included in the jump down. A longer jump down will carry more energy, so it'll be more towards the blue end of the visual spectrum due to the higher frequency. The smaller the jump down is, the less energy it'll carry and it'll be a longer wavelength towards the red end of the spectrum. As we also learned a bit earlier, all photons are the same, so you can use this process to emit light outside of our visual spectrum, like UV light or X-rays. One of the easiest ways of seeing this happen is to heat up metal. The heat will transfer energy, causing the atoms to vibrate intensely. When you take it out of the fire, the atoms will gradually lose that energy and produce photons, giving it a low-wavelength orange glow. 
after all the atoms lose enough energy that it won't produce visible light anymore, all that will be left is infrared light that require an instrument since your eyes can't see it. Another method of seeing this is with neon lights. All that's needed to cause them to emit light is to have an electric current pass through the gas to ionize the atoms. This ionization will change the charge of the atoms and make them move to one end or the other of the tube. This creates a lot of collisions that excites the atoms and transfers energy between them. This exchange will make them start producing photons of specific colors. Neon produces orange light, hydrogen produces red light, helium produces yellow light, carbon dioxide produces white light, mercury produces blue light, and so on. If you've ever stood close to a neon lamp, you'll also know that a lot of this energy is also given off as heat. This additional heat comes from photons produced with an infrared wavelength that we can feel but we can't see. Another interesting thing about photons is that there's no acceleration. The very instant that they're born, they're traveling at the speed of light in a vacuum. The only thing that can make them slow down is when they travel through mediums. Remember at the beginning we said that photons are waves of electric and magnetic fields? Well, it's that field that interacts with the atoms of that medium essentially slowing them down. The amount that light slows down in a specific medium is what we call their refractive index. Now with this newly acquired knowledge of what light is made of, we can now talk about some of its more specific behavior. Let's start with spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the study of the interaction between matter and electromagnetic radiation. We started by studying visible light, but this field advanced to include an incredible amount of things. The way spectroscopy works is by analyzing the spectrum of any light that reaches us. This was originally done through a triangular prism that showed all the colors of the visible spectrum from sunlight. This spectrum contains some very specific dark lines. Remember how we said that when electrons jump orbits, they can only do it when they absorb a photon of a precise amount of energy? Well, here's how that can be observed with spectroscopy. If you analyze the light from hydrogen gas, for example, you'll only have some very specific lines of color, like this. If you analyze neon gas, you would get this. And if you analyzed iron gas, you would get this. This is because the atoms of these gases are only able to have their electrons jump to very specific orbits. This jump will emit energy that corresponds to a specific wavelength and therefore a very specific color of light. These are called emission lines. If you shine all the colors of the visible spectrum through this gas, in other words white light, you would be exciting the atoms because they're able to absorb some of the photons of specific energy levels. With hydrogen, neon, and iron, it would show up like this. These dark lines are called absorption lines. So just by analyzing the lines on the spectrum, we can know what types of atoms and molecules are interacting with the light. Spectroscopy became a fundamental tool for studies in physics, chemistry, and astronomy. It allows us to study things as small as the molecular scale, even over astronomical astronomical distances. I'll add a link in the description if you want to see the spectral lines of more elements than the ones I've mentioned here. Now let's look at another behavior of light. We'll start with an example using sound waves. Watch this. This is what we call the Doppler effect, and it applies to all types of waves, including sound and light. For the person in the car, the sound just remains constant, but for the person on the side of the road, the sound changes dramatically. As the sound moves towards you, the waves will be compressed and result in a gradually increasing pitch. Then as the sound moves away from you, they'll be stretched and result in a gradually decreasing pitch. With visible light, the same effect happens. Objects moving towards you will shift towards a blue color, and objects moving away from you will shift to a red color. This is commonly known as redshift. Combining the Doppler effect with spectroscopy allows us to know which elements are in a star's atmosphere and what type of light it's emitting. Then measuring the light waves that we actually receive allows us to calculate the difference between what it should be and what we receive. This red or blue shift tells us how fast other celestial bodies are moving in relation to us. It's also what allowed us to discover that the universe is not only expanding but accelerating. Another very cool feature of light is what we call pair production. Even though photons have no mass, their energy and momentum allows them to behave as if they had mass. Pair production is when a high enough energy photon like a gamma ray smashes into an atom and converts itself into one electron and one positron that both have mass. 
These two particles are opposite of each other and will annihilate each other if they come into contact. If they ever did annihilate each other, it would release a photon with the same energy that created them in the first place, which would be a new gamma ray. The last thing I want to mention in this video is the double slit experiment. This experiment demonstrates a lot of complex quantum mechanics and deserves to have its own video. It shows how light behaves as a wave and how any observation made on it collapses the wave into a particle. There's also a variation called the quantum eraser that we could also cover that seems to be rewriting time. So if you want to learn more about those, be sure to let me know in the comments. So to recap, we learned that light is radiation, that it's made up of photons, that it has no mass, that it behaves like a wave and a particle at the same time, how its speed works and how it's affected by other mediums, how it can ionize other atoms, how it's absorbed and emitted, how it shifts due to its movements in relation to you, and how it can create particles with mass even if the photon itself has none. Did you ever imagine that light could do so much beyond the things that we could see with our eyes? How cool is that? If you like this video and want more content like this, please like and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions about what you'd like to talk about, put it down in the comments below or come follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Links are in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.